Okay, so we'll get started um, just so we don't overrun. Um, my name's Adrian Jackson and I'm from EPCC. And I'm going to talk today, give a, 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 an introduction um, to the new Intel Xeon 5 processor, the KNL. So I'm going to talk a bit about the hardware it presents, the hardware you get with it, um, how you can use that in software, and then some early performance benchmarking we've done and some uh, performance analysis numbers we have. Uh, a lot of the slides in here I've taken from Intel presentations, so this is not all my own work. This is the beast we're talking about, uh, Intel's second generation Xeon Phi processor, also known as Knight's Landing, because Intel seemed to like to have multiple names for everything. So it's a second generation Xeon Phi processor, it's a many core processor. You could argue that this is Intel's um, competition to GPUs, um, but it's quite different from the previous Xeon Phi. So the previous Xeon Phi uh, called Knight's, Knight's Corner, sorry. So we're talking about the KNL. So it's Intel's new Xeon Phi processor. It was launched in June. It's a main core architecture. Uh, but it has new ways you can use it and new hardware in it compared to the previous version, which was a KNC the Knight's Corner. So this, this current one's called Knight's Landing. I think the next generation will be called Knight's Ferry. Anyway. Um, there we go. So just this, is, this, is, this talk is mainly about the new version of the KNL. But just to give a bit of background, I'll, I'll give a couple of slides on the previous version, the KNC, and then we'll talk about what the KNL looks like and how it differs. So Intel's first many core processor called Knight's Corner um, looked, looked a bit like this. It had somewhere between 59 and 61 cores, depending on which version you bought. Um, each one of those cores could run four threads. It had it was a coprocessor, so it sat as a separate card in your in your in your computer attached over PCI Express bus, and on that card it also had eight, eight uh, gigabytes of of high bandwidth uh, memory, so graphics card memory. It was some in some ways like a GPU because it has quite a few cores and it sits in a, in a, a separate card, so it's a coprocessor. Uh, but in some ways it looked a bit more like a processor because you can, you could um, use it in a number of ways. You could use it as an offload machine. So you could offload kernels to it. So you could take small parts of your program and run them on the coprocessor, or you could actually log directly into it and compile and run programs on it. Um, compile programs and log in and, and run on it. And you would have access to external file systems and things like that. So that, that was called native mode. Uh, and it was able to do this because the processes it was using, the cores it was using, were a bit more functional or a bit more complex than GPU cores. So they were actually based on the old Pentium 5 processor with, with some modifications with a large vector unit on it and, and, um, and some other things. But it, it meant you could run actual full programs on there. The, the offered three different models of a duo, they still do offer the three different models of a KNC, um, going from 57, sorry, to 61 cores, and about 1.1 to 1.2 gigahertz um, with slightly diff different amounts of memory. Um, so in theory, you could get about one to 1.2 teraflops of double precision performance from the KNC. Um, but this was very much dependent on, this is very much dependent on fully using the vector units. So these very wide 512 bit vector units. So that's doing eight or 16 um, mathematical operations at once. And also using fuse multiply add instructions. So that was full vector units and each one of those operations was a multiply and an add at the same time. They had other restrictions on it as well. So because this processor was quite simple, because the cores were quite simple, each core can run four threads quite efficiently, but actually the way it worked, you weren't allowed to run just what, it wouldn't run instructions from the same thread every clock cycle. 
So you couldn't do what's called back-to-back -back scheduling. Um, so that meant you actually, to get good compute performance out of the KNC, you had to run at least 120 threads on it if you had 60 physical cores, um, just to let it issue an instruction every clock cycle. Sometimes you could, um, you could run up to 240 threads um, without, without oversubscribing the cores, but that didn't necessarily give you any good performance. So whilst it has a very high peak, potential peak performance, one, 1 1.2 teraflops, in reality, if you, if you ever got your program to run two or three times faster than on your standard compute node, like if we compare it to a compute node of Archer where you have two processors, each processor has 12 cores, you've got 24 in, in total, if you could ever get it to run up two times, two or three times faster than that node, then you were doing very, very well. You know, that was the kind of, kind of a performance you'd be looking to get. Um, and this was assuming you could have highly vectorized uh, communication, uh, highly vectorized computations. And also because this is a co-processor card, you weren't having to move lots of data across the PCI bus from your main memory in geographics, well, in geo Xeon Phi memory back again. Uh, just like with GPUs, we have the same issues with GPUs. You know, you can get very good performance on them as long as you're not shifting data backwards and forwards across the, the buses. Um, another uh, issue we had with the original uh, Xeon Phi processors is that the MPI performance on them was not uh, very good compared to on a standard node. And partly this was because you have larger numbers of cores, so you've got up to 60 cores. So the more cores you have, the harder work it is for MPI, the more overhead you have. But also it's to do with the way the um, processor was uh, set up. So uh, this top picture in this slide here, you have 60 some cores, um, but they're arranged on a ring, a bi-directional ring interconnect. So the MPI messages and uh, all the communications between the cores are going through these. And then you also have to worry about, well, where's my MPI actually uh, happening? Is it happening in the graphics memory? Is it happening on the, uh, the caches on the chips and these kind of things? So in the end, we never ended up getting very good MP pure MPI performance off this. Now, of course, uh, whether this is an issue or not depends on how you program it. And uh, Intel advises that you, for this kind of process of the KNC, you don't program it as a pure MPI machine. It's much it's much more designed to get good performance with MPI plus OpenMP, or large numbers of threads indeed. So if you could do something like have four MPI processes and then many threads from those and use the cores that way, that would, that would give you better performance. Um, but that was the KNC. Uh, we did quite a lot of work in, here in, in Edinburgh with, with mixed results. I mean, a lot of the simulation codes we look at are um, not necessarily amenable but to do hybrid, which is MPI plus OpenMP, but a lot of them are, are pure MPI codes. And so, we, so in a lot of cases, we were battling with MPI communication overheads, et cetera, et cetera. The good news is that the, the latest, this new processor, the Knight's Landing, KNL, uh, has addressed some of these issues for us. So this is uh, a, first of my Intel slides, I think, but this is uh, what the Knight's Landing looks like. So it, it comes with, uh, there's different versions you can buy, but it comes with up to 72 cores. And these are arranged on a processor actually as tiles. So each tile has two cores in it, and you can have up to 36 tiles per processor. And these are connected together it, as shown in this picture, in a 2D grid rather than as a, as a ring bus. It also has um, fast memory. Well, no, fast is the wrong word. I this one. High bandwidth memory attached directly to the processor. So these boxes that we see on this picture called MCD RAM, that's special memory which is stacked on top of a processor, and you get high bandwidth access to that memory directly from the processor. Uh, alongside that, this KNL chip can uh, has memory controls in it, so it can communicate directly with main memory, uh, and that means that you can access the onboard memory, the MCD RAM, but you can also access your main memory, your DRAM, 
the standard memory of a node directly from Volcano. So it can access all the memory in a, in a node. Uh, not, it's not like a, a, a VKNC or a GPU where you have to go through the main processor to get access to the main memory. You can see all the data that's in the, in the DRAM you have access to. The uh, individual cores have been um, upgraded to so a much more modern cores. Uh, Intel say they have three times the, the scale of performance compared to um, the previous version of the KNC. So that's of the, the serial performance on a like by like basis should be about three times on the KNL that is on the KNC. If you take one core and compare it to the other. The, cores themselves can run four threads efficiently, but because it's a more modern core, we don't have this back-to-back -back scheduling issue. So you can actually get good performance from this just by having one thing per core, one thread, one process per core. You don't need to oversubscribe it, but you can do. So if you've got 72 cores, you could quite happily just run 72 MPI processes on there and you should get reasonable performance, but you could have 144, you could have MPI running two or four or three or four open and P threads and, and still get reasonable performance there because it deals with the switching between threads on the core quite efficiently. Um, okay, yeah, so it, another one of the um, things that has happened with this new processor is it's now by default no longer a, a co-processor. So it doesn't go on a separate card and get plugged into a plugged into a PCI Express slot and you have to have a normal processor and a coprocessor. It is what's called self-booting. So your node can just consist of a single KNL and some memory inside it and all the other things you have. So you can have a KNL, you can have main memory, um, and where you go, you can just run your programs directly on the KNL. It's not to say they won't bring out a version which is a coprocessor. So they are still talking about selling this as a coprocessor, as, as a card you plug into computers, possibly for in for um, other kind of industries, but they haven't brought that version out yet. And at the moment, they're just selling it as a standalone self self hosting um, chip. It still has the very large vector units we had in the KNC, so 512 bit vector units. This is actually that not that on not that uncommon now because if you compare that with the model processor the broadwell that is also i think sporting it, it, if it's not then the next generation the skylake will have as large a vector unit so large vec 512 bit vector units are not uncommon now for for modern processors they have upgraded some of the vectorization instructions or added some new vectorization instructions for their knl um, to deal with uh, things like memory gathers and scatters, uh, which the, the uh, KNC was not very good at um, dealing with. So there is some hope that stuff that didn't vectorize very well or vectorize but didn't give good performance on the KNC should give better performance on the KNL um, because of these new vector instructions. There also will be ver versions of this processor where they bring the network onto the processor as well. So at the moment, they've got memory on the processor, um, the, the MCD RAM, uh, but they are also going to deliver in ones with OmniPath. So Intel are making a new uh, network called OmniPath, uh, and they will be on the processor as well. Uh, yeah, OK. So as already discussed, one of the new features of this processor is it has memory on the processor itself, as well as access to the main memory. So the KNL has direct access to all your main memory. You should from that see the same latency and bandwidth pretty much as you would see from a standard processor. So, I mean, it's the more modern processors than we have in Archer, but if you had a Broadwell system, uh, which is Intel's latest, uh, processor, then you be, should be seeing similar memory access latency and memory bandwidth from a KNL as you would from Broadwell. Um, maybe slightly less, it depends what you're doing, because of course you've got 72 cores 
got up to 72 cores inside this process. So if you're sharing that bandwidth between all the cores, you may see slightly less per core. But notionally, each core has good um, and sort of equal access to a bandwidth and latency to main memory. And then we have this new MCD RAM, which is not fast, but high bandwidth memory on the chip and the 16 gigabytes. Um, so this has much higher bandwidth than main memory, probably about five or six times, possibly more the bandwidth to main memory, but it actually has light, slightly higher latencies. So the cost of getting an individual bit of data from MCD RAM is actually higher than getting a single bit of data from your main memory. That's because to make this MCD RAM the processor we have arranged it with a bit more logic inside the circuits to do this of address matching and uh, communication routings. So it's about it's about we say about 10% slower getting data, but it's much higher bandwidth. So what does that mean? If you're if you're going to be reading in or writing large chunks of data, then you'll get much better performance out of the MCD RAM. If you're going to be reading or writing small little bits of me data in different places in the memory, then actually you would probably end up getting worse performance out of the MCD RAM because they are latency dominated, not, not um, bandwidth dominated. Uh, this MCD RAM uh, can be set up in, in a number of different ways. The first one is something called cache mode. And here the MC, it, it sort of does what it says on the tin. The MCD RAM just becomes a transparent cache for your main memory. So you don't, from a programming point of view, see this new memory. The hardware just treats it as a next level cache. Um, and any memory accesses you do are pushed through that like they would in, in, in a normal cache. So effectively, you've just been able to here push your uh, last level cache up from a few megabytes up to 16 gigabytes and then you've got a very large cache space for this 72 core processor. Um, because the MCD RAM is a bit slower than DRAM, you, you cache misses, individual cache, cache misses here are going to be a bit more expensive than if you were just going out to DRAM just because you've got to do uh, access to the MCD RAM and then another access to the DRAM itself. But if you're doing work which is high bandwidth, th this cache mode lets you use this this fast me this high bandwidth memory without having to change your application at all. The, ha the hardware just deals with it for you. So you just run your, your program as normal. All the your data access are cached through this MCD RAM, and you haven't had to change your application at all. There is another way you can use the memory, and this is called flat mode. And here the MCD RAM and the DRAM and your main memory are exposed as just two separate memory spaces. Um, it's So you can access the MCD RAM just by doing allocates and deallocates on it. But if you don't change your application, you won't use it at all. So you won't get access to it by default. If you don't change your application, you won't use it. But if you know what your application is doing and you know its performance sort of characteristics, this lets you have a much finer control of where you, which, which kind of memory you store data in. So if there are data structures in your application which are uh, bandwidth bound, so which are, you load large, large chunks of data from and reuse, you'd want to put them in the MCD RAM. And if there are uh, data structures in your program which are much more jumping around in memory, much more sparsely populated, you'd want to have them in the DRAM, the normal memory. Of course, the other thing you have to be aware of here is that MC DRAM is, is, much, is generally much smaller than your DRAM. So on Archer, our DRAM per node is either 64 gigabytes or 128 gigabytes. Um, it's likely, so the, the systems we've had access to on KNLs, they've had 96 gigabytes of memory in them. And, the, and then the MCD RAM is only 16 gigabytes. So for a lot of applications, whilst it might be nice just to use MCD RAM for your storage, you probably run out of space there and you're probably going to have to use the DRAM. So unless you're going to use it in caching mode, you'd need to have a little think of where do I switch, which memory is suitable for which data structures and what will I store where. 
There is also a, a, an alternative use of this memory where you can, what's called hybrid. So you can have part of your MCD RAM as a cache and part directly accessible by the programmer. Um, and in the documentation I've seen, they're talking about, you know, you can have 25% of your MCD RAM as a cache or 50% as a cache. And, and this might also be quite a, a reasonable option as well, because 16 gigabytes is a very large cache. If you either had only had 25% of it as cache, you had four gigabytes as cache, and the other, um, the other uh, part of it is available, the other 12 gigabytes is available for your program to use as, as, as and when. Um, this is another Intel slide, but it's just trying to show actually for a lot of things they ran, these are, these are small kernel benchmarks by and large, but for a lot of things they ran, they saw, they see quite good performance using the MCD RAM, so this is cache hit rates. But you know, they, the, they are trying to demonstrate here for, for a large number of applications, even if your data set you're using is, is quite big, up to 100 gigabytes or more, um, you can still see the MCD RAM acting as a, as a, as a beneficial cache, so getting 80, 90% uh, rates in there. And actually, I think this has um, surprised Intel a little bit. They, they seemed quite surprised about how well the cache mode performed. And um, they, I think their feel, feeling is that for a lot of applications, you probably don't need to directly manage your MCD RAM. You can just use this cache. Of course, there are applications where this won't be sensible. So, I mean, this, the yellow line there, you can see that uh, oh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a few lines at the bottom of this. Um, uh, graphs where they they don't use the cache very well and they're down to sort of 50 40 percent hit rate um, and that would mean that you're probably not getting very good performance out of this mc out of this mcd ram or, or your memory in, in general how do you use the how so if you're not doing it in cache mode but you're going to use it in this flat mode how do you access how do you allocate and deallocate data uh, how do you control this memory? Well, there are a couple of ways we can do this. So the first way is we can do a sort of a bulk memory policy uh, configuration, which there's a program called NUMA control. Uh, so the MCD RAM is exposed in hardware to you as a NUMA region, a non-uniform memory access region. And you can use this NUMA control program to say, actually, if I run my application, I want you to, by default, allocate all the memory it uses in MCD RAM. Uh, so you don't have to change the application, you just say push all my memory into MCD RAM. And that's what um, these lines at the bottom of the slide are doing. There's a, I'm doing an MPI run, and then I'm doing a NUMA control minus M1. That's because my, my MCD RAM is, is a memory node one. Um, and then I'm saying uh, run this application. So that's saying, mandate that all my memory for this cast app run comes from the MCD RAM. You can also do a preferred option, so use minus P instead, and you can say, right, all my allocates, put as many as my, my first allocates as you can do into the MCD RAM. If we run out of MCD RAM, we'll then go back to main memory. Of course, this may not give you ideal performance. I mean, it depends on what your program's doing. If you allocate a bunch of data structures at the beginning of your program, which take a lot of space, but are not heavily used in the program, then of course they'll all go into MCD RAM first, and then maybe your main data structures that you're um, relying on for performance will end up in DRAM, and it's maybe not what you want to do. Uh, just in a little bit more detail, the, the text in the middle of the screen is, is, is how you can find out what um sort of memory you have available here so this is where i run numa control dash dash hardware uh, and this is printing out what hardware i have access to so actually i ran this not on a knl but on a normal um xeon system um, and you can see actually that this normal xeon system has got two processors in it each processor has got 12 cores and each processor has about 50 gigabytes of memory attached to it if you run this on the KNL, you'll see something similar, except node one probably uh, won't have any uh, CPUs associated with it. It'll just have a, a memory space associated with it. But by and large, on the KNL, the way it's set up, the new MCD RAM is NUMA node one. So you can use this NUMA control stuff to say, just put it all into NUMA node one. 
as I say, if there's any questions as we go in along, please do just um, just uh, drop a comment in into the uh, collaborate, and I'll try and keep an eye on them and and uh, answer your questions as we go along. So that's a very uh, raw way of doing this, and uh, it's a very it's, it's a nice way to take your application and just try it out the MCD RAM and see if it makes a difference for you, what kind of performance impact it has. You know, ideally on a test case which fits inside that 16 gigabytes. If you're wanting to do much more fine-grained control long term, so uh, take your application and, and uh, alter it so you manually allocate and deallocate data, how do you do that? Well, Intel have provided, um, oh, it's not all from Intel this, but there's a library out there called Memkind um, and Hi bandwidth malloc, which let you do this. So there's two libraries, one built on will one builds on top of each other. Um, you can go and download these. You don't need a KNL for it, right? You can you can go and download these. But they give you um, they give you this high bandwidth malloc call. So HBW underscore malloc call in C um, and for obviously in C. You can use that as well. And that will automatically um that will put your get that bit of data that array that variable whatever and put it into the into the high bandwidth memory into the mcd ram in fortran uh we don't have the same um malloc but there is a intel um pragma and intel uh, directive uh, bang dir dollar attributes fast mem and that will say uh, allocate data in the fast memory. In, well, they call it fast memory. It's not fast memory. High bandwidth. That should really be high bandwidth memory, but it's called fast mem from Intel. Uh, just a note here: the automatic variables will be allocated in into DRAM in your main memory. So um, that means that some depending where you're, how you're programming, you may have to alter some of the variables you use. So they're not automatic variables, but they are allocated variables and you manually allocate them in, into the uh, MCD RAM if that's where you want them to be. They also have a, um, I, I think it should be there now, um, something in C++, so the standard vector allocator in C++, which will allocate memory in the MCD RAM as well. Because, so I've done work before, we work with people with Fortran codes who, who, um, who are slightly different from the than normal code. So um, I work with a code where they call malloc from Fortran um, rather than um, al using allocate, uh, allocatable variables. And to support this, we actually wrote a um, small wrapper to the high bandwidth malloc call, which is available from from the um, high bandwidth from this library here, high bandwidth malloc library. So we wrap around the high bandwidth malloc call, um, and you can actually call that directly from Fortran. So it's not especially nice Fortran, but you can do it. You can use the C to Fortran interfaces, the ISO to C bindings, and um, we we created a module which will um, let you call malloc from your Fortran code and allocate this data directly on um, the MCD RAM and deallocate it obviously yourself to free yourself. So if anybody's interested in that, it is up it is up on uh, GitHub um, and you can go and get that. Um, and also actually interestingly, this MC, so this is maybe not as relevant now, but this high bandwidth NUMA control and this memkind stuff lets you actually emulate high bandwidth memory on a normal processor. So uh, about six months ago, you'd have been quite interested in saying, well, we haven't got the KNL yet, but can we see what impact high bandwidth memory may have on my application? If you have a if you have a multiprocessor node, like you have an arch with up two cores and they had memory attached to each core, well, you can actually use this to simulate it. So you can say, when I run my program, always allocate my um, cores onto one processor but take the memory from the other processor and because that memory is on a different NUMA region it'll cost you more time to get there so you can see the impact of it having far away memory or close memory can have on you um, but given that we have 
canine processors come in uh, been installed around the the country then it's probably not as interesting to most people to do this but you can you can do it on a, a standard process you can play around with memory access times and say let's try and emulate this um, okay so that was the memory we also have um, these the, we have this new configuration of cores on the KNL. So instead of being in this ring bus, they are in this 2D mesh interconnect where each core is connected to uh, four other cores and they can send messages between them. Uh, what does this mean? Well, it means that actually there are a number of ways you can set up this processor uh, based on how you want the communications to go in this mesh and actually how you want the memory to be sort of separated out in this mesh so we can see we actually have what looks like four quadrants here so there's mcd ram in each of the corners so you can actually split up this processor into four separate processors um, and this mesh will let you do this and, and, and understand that you've split it up and uh, and uh, understand what it means for the communications so for the KNL, we have what's called three clustering modes. We have all to all, quadrant, and sub numa clustering. Now we don't have to worry about this too much. We this is quite new stuff, and we actually here haven't played with these at all um, in terms of performance to see what it has done. But by and large, the um, configuration that will be used will be quadrant mode. Uh, and that's because it gives good performance and it does the sensible thing. Uh, it is possible to reconfigure these in other modes for other reasons. So let me just give you a brief introduction to them. But as I say, we don't need to worry about them too much because in reality, you, you, it, it doesn't look likely that you're going to want to change these clustering modes for your using the KNL. So in quadrant mode the chip is divided into four virtual quadrant quadrants so e each um, corner um, has a has a virtual quadrant in it and then addresses to a directory in the same quadrant are hashed to that memory what does that mean it basically means that if you've got a tile if you've got a core in a quadrant then when it's going to use um, either the ddr or the mcd ram it will use the uh, memory which is where the controls are the closest to it okay doesn't stop it using all the memory because there is are only virtual quadrants it doesn't stop it using all the memory so it can any core can go and allocate all the memory but by default if it hasn't run out of space it will use the memory which is closest to it okay and this is all done for you in in software so you don't have to worry about it it's set up inside the inside the communications of, of the KNL um, and you just use your KNL as normal and it should all give you good performance. It is possible to um, to also set it up in what's called sub NUMA clustering which is instead of having virtual clusters they actually enforce these four quadrants they enforce them as physical clusters so that means that uh, you effectively look like you have a four processor system here instead of one 72 core system you've got four um whatever that is whatever 72 divided by four is a uh, core system um that can be good uh in terms of actually it means that you're always going to access the memory which is quickest for you but it does mean that um if you try and allocate or use more memory inside your quadrant for a given core you'll have problems uh, and actually you can do this on archer this is very much like the um i think it's the minus capital s flag for ap run where it says do strict uh, memory memory segmentation so that you only access memory which is connected directly to your processor and not other processors so this is possible but i don't uh, and it, 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 there is a chance that it, for some applications it gives you a little bit better performance, but I can't see it being a massive issue or a massive win for Arch people. And then it is possible to say uh, we have this all to all mode where it says actually when we're, a, when we're a, a core and we're accessing memory, don't care about where that memory comes from. Actually, we just actually split our memory up into just a uniform distribution across all cores and then um 
then we go away and just use whatever we've given. Uh, this is a very strange mode because it's likely to give you much low, well, lower memory performance um, for, for most applications. I'm not really sure why, why uh, Intel uh, export this or enable this on the processor. It could be that this is just for default mode. You know, this is what everything's built on top of. So that's, that's where it's by as for. Or it, there may be some cases where you're doing sort of non-local memory stuff that it may make sense. I don't know when you've got a very large data set and you're trying to distribute it across the processor. But anyway, so that's what the all to all mode is. Um, okay, so when we actually, so we've talked about different memory modes and different clustering modes, the different ways you can set up the interconnect on the KNL. Yes, okay, it might be good for. What's GPAS? The... Anyway, um, interestingly enough, of course, the question comes how do we use these different modes? Uh, and actually, so switching between cluster and, um, sorry, switching between cache and flat mode, or switching between all to all clustering mode, or quadrant mode or sub NUMA quadrant mode, um, they're, they're done at boot time. So you can only change between these different modes by rebooting the KNL. Uh, on the system we've had access to, so this is not a CREA system, um, that's done by, by you submit a request. When you put in your batch job, you, you put a special script in which will reboot the node. I'm not sure what the uh, Cray way of doing this is. So when these uh, KNLs are integrated into Archer, I'm not sure how we do this or, or what the policy is, whether they'll come up by default in cache mode and quadrant mode, and that's all you'll get, or you'll be able to change it. But fortunately, there is going to be a much more Cray-specific, Archer Cray-specific webinar, uh, virtual tutorial like this. Um, to, to describe how you actually going to use it and configure it on Archer. And that's going to be in a couple of weeks time. So Wednesday, the 12th of October, there'll be details on, on that kind of thing, how we do um, configuration and set up on, uh, on, uh, on, 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 on Archer. How do you compile and run programs for this? Well, just like before with a KNC, um, you can use MPI or OpenMP to program this. Uh, you can probably also use Intel Silk. Uh, as far as I am aware, OpenCL is not supported um, at the moment, but that may change. And it's Intel compilers at the moment. The nice thing about the KNL is it's pretty straightforward to take your code and just run it. You, to, you, to run, you don't even have to recompile. If you've been with the Intel compiler before, you should just be able to take it straight across and it will run. Now to get best performance, you may want to recompile and you can add this flag minus X mic AVX 512. And that's all you need to do. That's all the only change you should need to make to build an application for the KNL is to add this uh, uh, X flag, which, which says actually we're using uh, the AVX 512 from the Xeon Phi um, and, and away we go. For running it, you can then just run this as a standard MPI job or, or a standard OpenMP job. Now, this MPI run line I gave here is from the system we've had access to. So this is running across two KNLs using a PBS node file. Um, it's unlikely this is how you'll do it on the KNLs we have for Archer, but more details will be given um, uh, in the third webinar. So I assume that'll be done through AP run. Um, and it will just you'll be able to run it as a standard AP run job onto the onto the KNLs. Um, if if you are running in this sub NUMA clustering mode, uh, where it physically enforces this memory separation, uh, but then you also just want to use one process, so one MPI process and lots of open MP cores, then you may want to use the NUMA control thing to do. Uh, to give you access to that very remote memory, which you don't normally get access to. But that's a very edge case, so I wouldn't worry too much about that. Um, yeah. 
So Fiona's asked me a question. What's the difference between NUMA control memory mode one and switching between cache and flat modes? So, okay, I obviously didn't describe this in good enough detail. Apologies, Fiona. But um, the NUMA control thing will only work in flat mode. So it, it's only going to work where you have more than one memory region. Um, and you only get more than one memory region in flat mode because in cache mode, you don't actually get to see the, the MCD RAM at all. So it doesn't appear as a NUMA node. You don't get to address it. So NUMA control one, um, NUMA control uh, dash M one in the flat mode says, um, force all my memory use from this application to be in MCD RAM and don't use the DRAM at all. Run out of MCD RAM crash, the segmentation fault. If you do NUMA control minus P1, so preferred mode, it will say allocate all my memory for this application from MCD RAM until you run out of memory and then go into normal uh, main memory and then uh, away you go. In terms of performance, if your data set fits inside MCD RAM, so it's 16 gigabytes or less, um, then there should be no difference in terms of performance between using flat mode with NUMA control minus M1 and cache mode, because effectively um, it's doing the same thing. In fact, it may actually be slightly fatter, faster to use a flat mode rather than a cache mode, because you're not having to do a axis of MCD RAM and an axis of DRAM. Um, the real difference though comes when you start to have data sets for applications which are bigger than 16 gigabytes, where you can't fit it all into the MCD RAM by default. And then cache mode automatically manages that data sets for you. Whereas, um, whereas flat mode, you have to manage the data for you, but you have much finer control. Yeah, so for cache mode, uh, you if you're going to be using any more than 16 gigabytes in the first instance, you want to use cache mode because you don't have to change your application, but it still gives you this MCD RAM. If you find the MCD RAM is not good for your performance, i.e. you're a latency dominated program, you spend a lot of time looking up small amounts of data, then flat mode is what you'll want because you don't want that automatic MCD RAM for you. Uh, but for a lot of applications, we would expect cache mode is probably the way to go down there in the first instance. And I'm assuming the create setup will let you switch between these relatively swiftly and sensibly. But we'll see in the third um, webinar. Okay, so that's that's all I wanted to describe uh, about the hardware. Um, it, other than that, the KNL looks pretty much like a like the processors we have in Archer. You know, you can think of it as just a larger set of the processors we have in Archer, uh, and actually even more so if you have a computer with a new Broadwell processor, it looks much more like that. The, the serial performance may be a little slower than what we have in Archer. Uh, but the, the sort of functionality and the way you use them is very, very similar. Uh, but if there are any questions uh, on any of that or, or things I have not explained uh, properly or have missed, please just let me know. Because if not, I'm going to just go in and talk a little bit about some initial performance experiences that we've had at EPCC. Um, this is data that we've collected, and particularly some of it comes from Fiona, Fiona Reed EPCC as well. But um, as I say, if anything occurs to you that you want it better explained, do let me know. Otherwise, I will. So we have had access to the same KNL processors that we're going to have in Archer, as I believe. So these are what are called 7210 KNLs. Um, they're 64 core processors, so they're not the full 72. They've got the 16 gigabytes of MCD RAM. They're running at 1.3 gigahertz. Um, and these nodes had 96 gigabytes of main memory in them, DDR4 in them. So overall, you had 96 plus 60, uh, 16 gigabytes of memory. So we had 112 gigabytes of memory overall, but 16 gigabytes in the MCD RAM on the KNL and 96 in the main memory. And I think, I believe, these will be these are exactly the same as the processors that we will get in the Archer KNL system. Um, and so we've played around with a number of 
applications that we we know played with in the past just to see what the performance is like so the first one is uh, gs2 which is a plasma gyrokinetics plasma uh, program for um, uh, mpi so this is not hybrid or at least this version we're using is not hybrid it's just a pure mpi version um, and this is uh, actually quite a small test case we run in here uh, it's a small test case because we wanted to compare performance between this and the and the KNC, the Knight's Corner. So it, it must it, it fits within the eight gigabytes we had available on the KNC. So what does the performance look like on this? Well, on Archer it runs in about two point one minutes on twenty four cores. Um, so that's on Archer Ivy Bridge. If we put it onto the KNL and we run in flat mode and we don't do anything with the MCD RAM. Then it runs in about three, three point zero eight. So it says three point one minutes. So it's about, well, you're talking about twenty five percent, thirty percent slower going from Archer to KNL. Of course, this is a slightly, in some ways, unfair comparison because we're going from twenty four MPI processes on Archer up to sixty four MPI processes on the KNL. So our MPI overheads will have gone up a bit which will have made uh, the run a little bit slower. But still, this is what it looks like. You know, it's quite, it's a reasonable comparison Archer to KNL. In fact, Archer nodes now look a bit old in terms of processes and KNL. So, but that's what we see. However, if we then used a MCD RAM, which I've stupidly called fast memory here, but really should be called high bandwidth, um, then we see the performance is actually better than we get on Archer. So it's gone from, 2.1 minutes on Archer to about 1 minute 75 on the KNL using the MCD RAM. And that, where we say that, that line where I say KNL with fast mem, that was using this NUMA control thing because we could fit the whole data set inside the MCD RAM. So we just said put all the data on the MCD RAM and away you go. If we then compare that performance to KNL in cache mode, we see a very similar kind of thing. And, and this is what we would expect really because the data set just fits inside the MCD RAM anyway. Uh, we don't see a significant impact from going to the cache mode from flat mode. It gives you about a similar kind of performance. Interestingly, if we then compare it to a Broadwell node, so these are newer processes in an Archer, we can see that the KNL isn't quite as fast as the Broadwell. Um, again, the Broadwell is only 36 cores, so the MPI overheads will be a bit less, but still the Broadwell is, is um, quite a modern processor and, and sort of the proper comparison with the KNL. Uh, and we can see that we're doing well on the KNL, but not quite as well as the Broadwell, even, even with this high bandwidth memory. Now, I should say we haven't done any optimization of the codes here, so we've not done anything to try and exploit the uh, um, vector units properly on any of these, or we haven't done things like, if this is a hybrid code, we could run multiple threads on the KNL and see if that improves performance. But this is just taking the code and running it as it is, see what performance we get. So we get reasonable performance, better than Archer, not quite as good as a, a more modern processor than Archer. This is uh, just, to, just for comparison, if we compare the KC numbers we saw, we had for the same code, same test case, then actually, um, we get much better on the KNL than we got on the KNC. So the best we ever had on the KNC for this was about 6.77 minutes. And we can see on the KNL we're down to 0.76. So the KNL compared to the KNC, the KNL with the high bandwidth memory is going somewhere like four or five times faster, which is nice. But as I say, it's still not quite as fast as Broadwell for this application. Another, another code we, we played with was uh, CASTEP quite common as used on Archer, materials modeling code. We used a relatively small benchmark again, so this is the, um, this is a, one of the standard CASTEP benchmarks. We made it slightly larger to, to run on the, on the KNL uh, and, and then compared performance again across Archer, KNL and the Broadwell. So we can see on our here, Archer it takes about 100 seconds. KNL without the MCD RAM, about 150 seconds, and then KNL with cache mode turned on about 146 seconds. So interestingly, the, the, the high bandwidth memory here, 
the, the MCD RAM isn't really benefiting Castet for this application. Um, again, we've got a comparison here between 24 cores and 64 where the MPI costs will have gone up a bit for the 64 core stuff. And uh, this test case for, for Castet probably is quite MPI heavy. So that could be one of the explanations. Uh, but we need to do a bit more work in understanding why the cast step isn't doing as well here. And, it, and it, it could be those things that can be optimized out there. This is just what it came out of the box. Interestingly, if we compare cast step on Broadwell now, uh, it's doing significantly better, both in KNL and Archer. So uh, we can see on Broadwell, it's going about two and a bit times faster for cast step than it, than it was on Archer um, and not so for KNL. So uh, it was quite nice in some ways, but we now have sort of a number of different processor options for uh, for, for systems, uh, KNL, any core stuff, or GPUs, or Broadwell, and and we're seeing sort of quite different performance for different applications on them. So something like GS2, you could say that well, KNL and Broadwell are, are similar, not the same, but similar. Uh, Castep, KNL, and Broadwell quite different and uh, arguably um, you know there's something interesting going on there which we'll, we'll need to have a look at uh, but this is um, this is just our first experiences uh, then Fiona did um, some extensive runs with CP2K on um, on the KNL as well uh, but what's what's the uh, takeaway message from these well uh, she's comparing here MPI with OpenMP versions of of CP2K, but also uh, normal version uh, versions run in flat mode with no with no MCD RAM and versions run in flat mode with MCD RAM. So we can see here, for instance, the bottom curve, the the grey triangle uh, with a dotted line. If we then compare that to the um, red triangle above it, that's the the difference between those lines. There is how much the MCD RAM is helping us on the on the KNL, so we can see that actually it gives a bit of a performance improvement, but nothing massive. So uh, on on our GS2 test case, we saw the code went about twice as fast, or something like twice as fast with the MCD RAM. For CP2K, we can see about a 10% benefit or something of that order. Uh, Fiona will correct me if I'm wrong uh, from using the MCD RAM, but it's not you know order of it's not twice as fast or, or anything like that. Uh, the other interesting thing from this benchmark is you can see here that actually you can get about the best performance you can get is on 64 cores. So you don't have to use this 128, 256 cores. You don't have to use all the threads. You can get pretty much as good performance as you get on uh, the 64 cores. So we don't have to go um, uh, multi-threaded here if we, if, we, if we don't. We see a slight benefit from going multi-threaded, but not a not a massive uh, benefit from going multi-threaded. Um, yeah, so Fiona's saying the MCD RAM helped for about 10 or 15 percent at best for CP2K. Um, interestingly enough as well, I don't have Archer on this, but Archer is still faster than KNL here. So I think Archer was about coming in at about 60 seconds, 60 or 70 seconds on this, whereas in the KNL we're seeing, you know, just sub 100 as uh, seconds is the, the best time we get. So we still see Archer as being 30% um, uh, faster than the KNL. Now, that doesn't sound brilliant, but actually if you compare it to these are our numbers from the KNC, so the old version of uh, Xeon Phi, um, the KNL are the, the lines at the bottom here, bottom of the graph, uh, and actually much, much better performance than we saw on the KNC. So, KNL for CP2K is, you know, 30% slower, but on that compared to Archer, but compared to the KN, uh, the, the old version, um, it's it's much much quicker. All right, so Fiona's saying that Archer is about 41 seconds versus 80 seconds for KNL, so so it's about twice as quick on Archer as on KNL, but on the KNC, the old version, it was much, much slower than that. So we can see that the, the KNC has got uh, significantly faster. Uh, KNL has got significantly faster than the KNC. 
which is nice. And as I say, there is maybe work we can do here to make something like CB2 KL cast it faster on the KNL. We just haven't um, had time to, to have a look at those things yet. So not, not much, I know I appreciate when that's an hour in now, so but not much more to go now. Uh, we have a we have a little um, LU factorization library which we play around with a little bit here. This was comparing L, this library we had on the K and C to Archer, anything above one here and the Xeon Phi, the K and C was better. So we could do okay on, on compared to Archer sometimes. If we then do go to K and L, uh, actually anything above uh, the light one here, the K and L is better than Archer performance. So we can see for pretty much everything apart from some of the MKL runs, um, then the K and L was given us two up to up to eight times from two up to eight times better performance. Von, Ar Von on Archer. Um, and then if we turn CDRAM on um, for this LU factorization, so it's very dense linear stuff, linear algebra stuff, we can see that the MCDRAM also helps as well. So anything below one here, and the MCDRAM is improving the performance of this library. So we can see that the MCDRAM is, in some cases, helping the, this LU factorization library go. Uh, up to 75, 70% faster than without the MCD RAM. Uh, and that's even helping for just things like uh, using the MKL library directly from our program. It's still um, ex managing to exploit the MCD RAM and, and um, do that kind of calculations. And finally, I don't know if you, you'll remember now, uh, all the way back to the beginning of this talk, but um, we had said, I had to say that on the K and C, we found that MPI performance was a bit of a bottleneck for a lot of applications. So we wanted to see what the MPI look, performance looked like for the K and L. So we ran some performance benchmarks, MPI ping pong. Uh, and here we can see that the bottom two lines, the green and the red line, are the triangle and the square at the bottom there, doing ping pongs on a, on a, on a multi-processor node, so just a standard two processes the node and we get um, certain performance. This is uh, latency for sending messages. If you look at the KNL, which is the middle line here, we can see that it has quite a similar performance to our normal computer node. So it's not quite as fast in MPI, but it's, it's, it's close. And then the top two lines here with the performance we got on the K and C, the old on five. So we can see that the KNL, our MPI performance is much better than it was um, on the old version, apart from very, very large messages where we start to see uh, performance tailing off a bit. Um, that was point to point messages, but if we look at all to walls and said so collective messages, this was for our K and C benchmarks. We could see that compared to the host, 16 persons on the host, the K and C was always an order of magnitude, in some places, two orders of magnitude slower doing MPI, this MPI all to all. So it's all reduced collective. If we now go and have a look at the K and L performance and compare it to the host, um, well, it's slightly complicated graph here, but it by and large, the K and L performance is much closer to what we see on the host. And that's comparing 16 processes doing an all reduced compared to 64 um, or 32 or 16 processes doing an all reduced. So, we, it's not quite as good, but uh, we get um, we get much better performance than we saw on the uh, old KNC. And actually, uh, yeah, at high core counts, uh, it's very similar performance. And we also were quite interested to see how this MCD RAM might affect uh, MPI communications on the um, on a node on a single K now. Um, so for large, so for small amounts of uh, small message sizes, it doesn't seem to have an impact. Um, but if we go up to uh, large message sizes um, and we are using the MCD RAM rather than normal memory, um, we can see that it does let us access some higher bandwidth than, than we would normally. So um, we have a strange kink in the curve here, about a thousand to two thousand bytes. But, uh, but really above sort of 16,000, 32,000 bytes, we can see that the high bandwidth memory is actually starting to give us a little bit of performance benefit over 
um, of the normal uh, memory. So I've missed out, uh, unfortunately missed out one of my um, things on the on the legend here, but the the, the third uh, graph I think is cache mode. I think that's what it is, yeah, cache mode. And we can see here a similar kind of, doesn't seem to have a massive impact on the latency of a, an MPI message, um, either not using the MCD RAM or using the MCD RAM, it doesn't seem to uh, massively affect the performance there, which is nice to know. Uh, and we see a similar kind of thing for um, all to all, uh, sorry, all reduce collective MPI uh, communication where actually the MC, the, the, the cache mode uh, or the fast memory does seem to help when we get to start going up to uh, bigger uh, message sizes. Actually, I think the, um, the legend at the bottom here, my message size in bytes is wrong. I don't think it's one to 22. I think it's the same as, as this one here um, going up in, in steps. But uh, we can see that for large, larger or all reduced message sizes, actually the, the, the MCD RAM, either a fast mode or a cache mode, is providing us um, some performance benefits. Okay, so that was just a little flavor of some of the results we've seen on, on KNL on a, on a test system. Um, the why are we talking about KNL at all? Well, well, Archer is going to be getting a, a KNL, a small KNL test system. Uh, there will be 12 KNL processes in the test system. The I, the expectation is this will be available uh, mid October. Uh, with Archer users being able to access to it, I think in the first month, this sort of unregistered, unrestricted access, uh, and after that, they'll be. Uh, charging on it, but it will, you know, you'd be able to, I believe, use some of your budget from the main machine onto the uh, KNL system. Uh, more details will will come out about that uh, probably in the third lecture, the third virtual tutorial. Um, and even if you're not currently an Archer user, then you'll be able to get access to this KNL system in, by the standard way. So you can go and do a um, take the Archer driving uh, license uh, and get an access free. Uh, um, through an account that way. Um, there will also be ECSE funding associated with this. Uh, so you should be able to ask for ECSE funding in the standard way. So this is, um, if, you're not, if you're unaware of what ECSE funding is, then you can go and have a look at the Archer website. But the ECSE is a, a funding program to, um, where you can ask for people or money to work on codes to improve uh, performance and um, port codes to Archer. I believe this has been extended to allow uh, KNL optimization and porting to be part of a remit of an ECSE project. More on that will be in the next virtual tutorial. So there's a virtual tutorial next uh, Wednesday, same time, where the ECSE funding program and uh, um, the uh, change for KNL uh, to that will be uh, discussed in more detail. Um, so that, uh, and then the final KNL uh, uh, seminar, which will give more details, right? Uh, the Archer KNL should then be installed and up and running, and um, we'll give more details of you know how you specifically use it on Archer. How do you submit to it? How do you log into it? How do you reboot nodes or change mode configurations, um, memory configurations? What the access policies are. I believe there will be, uh, you know, queue length restrictions and these kind of things, as in the normal way in Archer. But all these kind of details will be in the in the next in the final virtual tutorial on the 12th of October, and possibly even some uh, some more up to date performance numbers on using specifically um, those KNLs. Uh, and then finally, just to plug, I mean, all the performance numbers we've collected here. Uh, and I've talked about here, I've come through what's called uh, EPCC's IPCC, which is a collaboration with Intel, where we work on optimizing codes and porting codes to Xeon Phi processors. We also do some training and support of Xeon Phi. So we have some training courses on how to use Xeon Phi processors and how you can optimize codes for them. So if you have any questions or things you'd like us to look at or want to do some collaborations on KNL or something like it, then please do get in, in touch with us. We're, we're more than happy to do that kind of thing. Um, 
And that's all I wanted to say, apart from to remind you that there will be another virtual tutorial this time next week, talking about the ECSE funding for KNL. And then the final one, which will have the technical details about the Archer KNL system, will be on the Wednesday, the 12th of October.